Hey guys, how's it going? It's Jay from Sony Alpha Lab, and in this review, I'm going to be covering the Sony A6600. This is the latest and greatest APS-C crop factor mirrorless camera from Sony, and in this review, I'm going to cover everything you need to know. I'm going to go over all the features that matter. I tested the Sony A6600 using the 18 to 135 millimeter kit lens, the Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4 DCDN lens, which is a really fast prime lens, and I also used the killer full frame 200 to 600 millimeter GOSS lens. So I have a lot of hands-on lab testing, sample photos, sample video, and a lot more to show you. But before we get to that, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button below the video and that notification bell next to the subscribe button so this way you're informed every time I come out with a new video. If you find this video to your liking, please do me a solid, give me a thumbs up. There's a little icon below there, hit that thumbs up. It'll let other people know, hey, that's a good video, let me check that out. Below the video, there's a little line there that says read more in the description area. And below there, you will see links to recommended accessories for the Sony a6600 links to my lens guides and tutorials related to the Sony 6600 that'll help you use some of the features that I did dedicated tutorials on, such as custom back focus, for example. Below the video, there's going to be a navigation link section so you can get to the information that you're interested in. It's going to be quite a long review, and I want to make sure that you can get to what you want as quickly as possible. So the Sony a6600 goes for about $1,400 US, and that's a lot of money, but what you get for that money is a fair fairly compact, lightweight, weather resistant, magnesium alloy, sensor stabilized crop factor camera body and it really does pack a lot of power, there's no doubt about it. For example, it has a 180 degree flip screen, it has super advanced autofocus system with tracking, it has IAF for both humans and, and now animals, and it also has IAF when recording video, absolutely remarkable. It has a new FZ100 battery, so it has a larger grip, it's got more than double the battery life of the previous generation A6500 model. Now with that larger grip, it does weigh a little bit more, it went from about 450 grams to about 500 grams or one pound to 1.1 pounds so it gained a little bit of weight with that larger grip and battery but in my opinion well worth it because the weight gain is pretty minor for the most part but that larger grip makes it much easier to hold especially with a large lens so that grip really does help in that regard and the ergonomics are much better so when compared to the a6500 the a6600 is a little bit different camera body wise it does not have a built-in flash and like i already mentioned it has a much larger battery one significant downgrade however is the buffer size the buffer size is about half of the a6500 so if you want to take consecutive shots for sports shooting, for example, you're only going to be able to get about 46 raw files when consecutively shooting at like 11 frames per second. On the A6500, you were able to get up to like 107. So for some reason, Sony cut the buffer size in half, which is very disappointing. And I could only speculate Sony did this because they're planning on coming out with a, another model, like maybe a 7 series model or something in the future, or they're trying to push people to the Sony A9, the full frame sports shooting flagship camera. I'm not really sure why Sony would choose to do that, but they did add a number of other features to enhance it over the A6500. So the A6500 did have the Play Memories camera apps, but the A6600 does not. But what Sony did do was they put in the interval shooting feature, which is a really nice feature for time-lapse photography, and that's built right into the camera now, which is awesome. I actually have a dedicated video on doing time-lapse photography and using the interval shooting function on the Sony camera, so be sure to check below the video for a link to that tutorial. Another thing worth noting is on the top, the panoramic mode went away on the A6600, but what they did was they added another memory recall mode on the top mode dial here. So the A6500 normally goes for about $1,200 US, and the 6600 goes for $1,400, as I already mentioned, but at the time of this review, Sony's offering an amazing deal on the A6500, and it's currently 400 off, so it's going for $800 right now. I'm not sure how long that deal is going to last, but for $800, the A6500 is a steal, in my opinion. That's a really, really good price for an extremely powerful camera. The A6600 is definitely better in a lot of ways, don't get me wrong, but if you're a sports shooter and you really need that large buffer, the A6500 is a fantastic option. Just make sure you get some extra batteries because the 
battery life isn't the greatest. You're only going to get about 310 shots per battery as opposed to 810 shots on the A6600. So if you just got the A6600 and you're new to the camera, I also put together a quick start guide. So if you're, like I said, if you're new to the camera and you're not sure what to do and you don't enjoy reading manuals, check out my quick start guide and that'll get you up and running. I show you basically how to put the battery memory card in there, boot the camera up and do all the initial configuration that's required. It's really not rocket science, but if you've never done it before and you're new to cameras, that's a great guide for people like you. So be sure to check that out and that is linked below the video. Let's go over some sample video first quick, 4K quality. Baby shark, do 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 all right, so this is just showing off in particular the IAF abilities when recording video. And watch it just go right to the eye, the focus. It's incredible. And it actually comes up on the screen showing you. Bye-bye. So using the touch to focus feature while recording video, I just touched on the background and then touched on the shark to show off the transition effect. Hey, Jason. Whoa, look at him go, look at him go. Yes. You like that puppy? You like that puppy? Yeah. What are you? Huh? Jasmine, what a sweetheart. No. <laughs> All right, here's some quick handheld lab testing just to show you the image stabilization and everything and the focus transition using the Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4 lens. All right, so here's some 4K moon footage using the FE 200 to 600 millimeter lens. And I uh, was at 600 millimeter filming this whole thing on a tripod, but I did just zoom in in post-processing here so you can just see the incredible detail you can get. Next up is some 1080 at 120 frames per second, so you can actually slow that down in post-processing and create slow motion like this. Look at Layla walking here. So this was at normal speed and I just slowed it down because of the 120 frames per second. It's amazing what you can do at 120 frames per second. It looks really, really good. So just for reference, here's what the footage looks like at regular speed so you can see how much it smooths out when you uh, just slow it down in post-processing. I'm using Final Cut Pro, by the way, for that. Look at me. Another cool thing about recording in 120 is the camera does record audio as well. So here's just a quick beer pour that I sped up and slowed down so you can see what kind of effects you can get using the 120p slow motion abilities. It's pretty awesome. And I just sped it up here to even faster than normal. Slowed it down again to show that swirling effect and then sped it up. And we're back to regular speed now. All right, so here's some night footage of some snow falling, and I just, again, slowed it down and checked that out. Street light in the background out of focus, and just slowly pan to the left. Pretty amazing. All right, guys, so here we are looking at the A6600, and in the box, you basically get the charger with the cable, and you get the camera strap. And of course, I got mine with the 18 to 135 millimeter kit lens, so the lens hood's right here. I just don't have it on right now because I'm going to do some lab demonstrating. The eyepiece here also came. On the bottom here, you have the door where the battery and memory card go. Memory card goes right here, like so. And the battery is right here. There's a little blue lever here to pop that out, and so forth. So that's the bottom of the camera. You have the tripod mount right there. And the screen flips out like so. You can see what it looks like from the bottom. And it comes all the way out so you can flip it upward like so. And here's what it looks like from the back when it's flipped in the 180 position. Here's what it looks like looking at the camera in the 180 position. So you can see the screen if you want to do some selfie type work, vlogging work, or just selfie photography. And the screen also goes like this, so you can have it low to the ground, which is awesome for getting the camera on the ground when you're taking landscape photos and things like that. And it also aims downward, so if you have the camera over your head, you can aim the screen like that. So there's a lot of articulation there with the screen. On the side here, you have the ports. You have the multi-USB port on top. 
Then you have the micro HDMI port, you have the mic port, and you have a headphone jack. In addition, you have an orange light right there above the micro HDMI port that lights up when you're charging the camera if you're charging the battery while it's in the camera. Looking at the top of the camera, let's go over the top of the camera quick. You have the A6600, you can see 4K. This is the hot shoe right here. This little plastic thing comes off. You can put a flash unit and many other accessories will slide into the hot shoe but that's what that's for. There is no built-in flash on this particular unit, unlike the A6500, which does have a built-in flash. In addition, the A6400 and A6100 have a built-in flash, but this does not. This is the symbol that represents where the sensor is, so if you have to measure to the sensor, you would use that mark right there. You then have the shutter button here, which you just press, and you have the on and off toggle as you can see right there. You have custom buttons here. You have the speaker right there, and you have the mic inputs right here and here. So you have stereo mics. Also worth noting is how nice this grip is. You can see how much bigger the grip is compared to the A6400 and the A6500. It got significantly fatter, and it's much better ergonomically, in my opinion, when holding, especially with a large lens. Notice the mode dial here. We have auto mode, scene mode, slow and quick video mode. So you can basically change your frame rates and stuff like that with the slow and quick, which is quite nice. All different features. You have movie mode. You got memory recall modes one and two. Notice how there's no pano mode anymore on the mode dial. Then you have manual mode, shutter priority mode, aperture priority mode, and program auto mode. And then full auto is where it's at right now. Program auto is very similar to full auto, except it allows you to change some of the settings and uh, give you a little bit more control while still letting the camera pretty much do most of the work. Now, looking at it from the back of the camera, you have a navigation wheel here that spins, and you can also press it in all four directions. They're customizable. You have the garbage can, which is also a custom button, playback mode, which will bring you back into the playback mode, so you can view your photos and videos on the camera by pressing that. And then you have here your menu button, another custom button there, the function button which is awesome it's a quick menu there which will bring you to your key features and that also when in playback mode will work to push photos to your smart device using the imaging edge mobile app which I recently created a video for so be sure to check out that video tutorial on how to use that app if you want to learn how to transfer your photos to the smart device you are using also we have a dial here which will control your aperture and or shutter speed depending on what mode you're in in combination with this dial that spins if you're using manual mode. So you can actually control your functions with these dials here, and the feedback is quite nice. And a lot of customizable buttons on this camera, which is also very powerful. And I actually created a video to show you how to do custom back focus. A lot of people like to uncouple the autofocus from the shutter button. As it is by default, you press the shutter button halfway and that triggers your autofocus. But you can decouple that and then you can assign autofocus to a button on the back if you like to use back button focus. A lot of sports shooters like to use that, uh, wildlife photography and so forth. Very good for tracking subjects. So here we are in Lightroom and I just wanted to go over some real world sample photos. And like always, up here on the top left, you can see how the camera was set with the EXIF data. Now these were all shot in raw quality, that's why you're seeing .ARW here. And I was using various lenses, and I'll try to say what I'm using, but I just wanted to make you aware of the EXIF data on the top left here, you can always check that out. Here I was in Middletown and there was an amazing sunset, so I just took a couple of snapshots when I was getting out of the car in the parking lot. I was using the Sigma 30 mm f1.4 lens and it's a very very high quality lens as you can see here matched with the a6600 can't go wrong I was actually going to this place called Equilibrium and they just opened up their new facility over in Middletown it's a brewery and it's absolutely amazing some pretty cool symmetry here and here's just some snapshots from around the place they got this cool round bar there with all these taps and stuff and again you can see i was just pointing and shooting using the sigma 30 millimeter and the a6600 and it did a really good job take a look at this four ounce pour background blur and everything is just awesome color clarity focus on this camera is amazing and it just picked what i wanted pretty much every time and here we go just outside fireplace and then i switched i was using the kit lens here the 18 to 135 millimeter and i went to check out the green bridge zoomed in 
to 69 millimeter, you can get a shot like this. So what's nice about the kit lens and that zoom range that you have here. Here's another one, 61 millimeter, and then zoomed out at 18 millimeter, get a more wide angle view another shot and you can see the detail is quite good zoomed in on some weeds there you can see what kind of separation you can get that's at 135 millimeter and here's just a boot print some of the steel structure and here is some more of the bridge just a depth of field fall off type shot and here's just a pretty scene in the winter i actually cropped this one 8x10 format i thought it looked a little bit better and again just some more of the steel so you can see what kind of separation you can get at 135 millimeter if you're using the kit lens just a perspective shot and here's jace he got this cool thing it's called a cyclone it's pretty fun he got that for christmas and he was really enjoying himself just some snapshots around the house on christmas Layla got the playstation so she was checking that out with her cousin having a great time back to using the sigma 30 millimeter love that lens by the way here's looking down at the spirally staircase and you can see that awesome depth of field fall off creates a cool effect they also got a insta camera you know it just prints out the uh, prints right there on the spot it's really cool like a polaroid you know snowman shot just showing off some dynamic range testing and whatnot now here i was using the 200 to 600 millimeter lens and that paired with the a6600 is quite a beast of a setup the focus tracking was amazing i was using the tracking abilities and all these shots came out sharp it just focused on the eyes and he's driving towards me and i have the lens at 600 millimeter which is remarkable now here's just a shot unedited these are raw files now this one i edited in lightroom here i didn't really go crazy i just darkened it a little bit added a vignette brightened up the eyes just a tad and you can see just with a little love you can get an amazing portrait like so. He was loving this pedal car, by the way. Here's Layla riding her scooter. And just a few more of Jace. And here's one of Layla. Same thing. Just darkened the background a little bit. And here's one that's unedited, just so you can see the difference. There she is, smiling. So pretty. Now check out this moonshot. Unbelievable detail on this sucker. Here's just a picture of a uh, goose, or whatever that bird's called. Pretty cool reflection. Awesome separation you can get with that lens. And here's just the Blue Angels plane down at the park. I just took a couple of snapshots using that 600 millimeter again. And zoomed in on the antenna on the front. A couple different angles here. Here's just a fence so you can see the depth of field fall off. And here's with the Sigma lens again. Here's Jasmine, my parents' dog. And I was using the Animal IAF for these shots. And you can see it absolutely worked amazing. It just focused on the dog's eye every time. I actually took like 30 pictures and they were all sharp. But, you know, I just selected a few. And here's another moon shot. Now let me just show you really quick what I can do to this. So if I drag up the clarity, dehaze, texture, like so. And then I can scroll down here and add a little sharpening. And then I'm going to select the crop tool. And I'm just going to crop in on this thing like so. Something like that. And there you go. Drag up that texture and clarity a little more. Even add a dehaze just to get a little bit of more texture. And it'll bring in a little color with the vibrance. And you can see here's a before and here's an after. And you can see that was really done very quickly. And just look at the size of that crater on the top of the moon there. I don't think I've ever seen that before. It all depends on what angle the sun is actually lighting the moon from. But anyways, here's a picture of Layla. And I played with this one a little bit. I just brightened her eyes a little. But you can see just that razor blade sharpness and clarity. Here's another image using that Sigma. Now here I just wanted to show you quickly again what that Sigma lens can do. Now this is at 30 millimeter f1.4 and look at that background separation using, you know, just looking at this shark. I was at the minimum focus distance and now just comparing to the kit lens. Now here's the kit lens at approximately 30 millimeter and that's as close as I can get to the shark with the kit lens due to the minimum focus distance. So same focal length, 30 millimeter, one shot looks pretty much magical. So that's what a prime specialty lens can get you over the kit lens in case you're unaware. All right, guys, I'm just going to do a quick ISO test here. Now I was in raw quality and this is at ISO 102,400. So here's 51,200, here's 25,600, here's 12,800, here's 6,400, and I apologize by the way, I have a cold here, that's why my nose is all jammed up. Here's 3,200, see this is pretty darn clean, and no noise reduction has been applied here, these are just straight up raw files. Here's 800, 400, 200, 
and 100. Let me go to two to one here. So here is 6,400 and 12,800, 25,600, 51 and 102. You can see it's still really noisy, but you can still read the text and there is still quite a bit of detail there. So, you know, depending on the circumstance, this might work for you. You know, if you just have to get the shot in incredible low light or whatever. So it's nice to have that option. So just doing a quick stabilization test here, you can see on the left, I have stabilization enabled and on the right, I have it disabled. I was using the Sigma 30 millimeter for this test. And now with the kit lens, I was at 135 millimeter handheld, of course. On the left, I have a stabilization on, and on the right, I have it off. And you can see it's absolutely amazing what it does. Let's boot this camera up and let me show you some of the items in the menu area that I wanted to uh, show off. All right, so now I got the camera turned on and you can see here, I actually have a subject in my lab scene there that I currently have spinning on the turntable. And you can basically just touch to focus where you want it. And right now I have the touch to focus set to tracking mode. So it's now tracking the subject. If I press the shutter button down halfway, you can see it's tracking the subject and it just switched to IAF because it sees a human face and it sees eyes. So it's tracking the eye of the subject, and as you will see in a second, it's going to switch to just object tracking when it loses the eye. See that? Now it's just tracking the object. Let me just hit the menu here, and this is what the menu system looks like. Now to navigate with the menu, I am using the navigation wheel. You cannot touch the screen to navigate the menu. The touch screen does not work in that way. So you have to use the navigational pad. You can navigate by turning the dial, and you can also navigate by pressing the four directions on the dial. So in this menu system here, it's extremely deep and vast. If you scroll all the way up to the top, you're now on the tabs, and you can scroll left and right to quickly go through the various tabs, like so. And notice when you're in each tab on the top right, you have page numbers. So I'm on one of 14 in tab one. And if you go to tab two, it's one of nine. See that? So you got nine pages on this tab. Network tab, you got two pages. Playback and, and settings, seven pages. And then over here, all the way on the right with the star, that's the My Menu area. And this is awesome because you can custom configure this and load it up with all the favorite features that you like to use. And then if you want to get to those features, you just navigate to My Menu and those features will come up for you. So anyways, on tab one, if you go down, you have different file formats so you can shoot RAW, JPEG, or you can do RAW plus JPEG. Now one quick tip I wanted to give you, if you plan on sending your files over using the Imaging Edge software and you want the original files to go over, you have to shoot in either RAW and JPEG or JPEG mode. If you scroll down, you have a bunch of other options here, JPEG quality and so forth. And I'm just gonna go through this menu system quick and point out a couple of key features here for you. One other thing I wanted to point out, guys, if you're not sure what a feature does, on the bottom right of the camera, there's a picture Picture of a garbage can and it's also the custom 4 button. If you press that button, it'll give you like a preview of what any given feature does. So if I go to interval shooting function, for example, which is for time-lapse photography, and you hit that little garbage can on the bottom right, it'll tell you perform settings related to interval shooting, blah, 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 blah. So that's a very useful feature if you're in the menu and you're not sure what the option is. Just click that garbage can on the bottom right and it'll tell you, it'll give you like a description of what that feature does. I'm just gonna click the menu button here to go back. Then you have the memory recall options here. This is where you can program your memory settings for the memory recall features. You can register custom shoot settings here and then you re can recall those settings if you program it to a custom key. Then you have all these different other options for autofocus you have face eye AF select now this feature I wanted to show you because the camera is capable of doing both humans and animals and this is where you would change that and in order to select by the way you just select the center button in the navigation wheel and that will select a given option so I'm just scrolling down and then I'm gonna select and now on the left you can see you have a picture of an animal and a picture of a human 
So that's where you would change it if you want to take pictures of your pets. Pre-AF is basically the camera will pre-focus for you before you even press the shutter button. It will cost you a little bit of battery life, but it's a great feature if you want the camera to constantly track focusing, even if you're not pressing the focus button. It will theoretically make it focus faster depending on what kind of scene you're in. Now in here you have a bunch of other options, but because I'm in full auto mode, they're all grayed out. So let me change the mode to aperture priority mode. And now these features are not grayed out. So depending on what mode you're in, some features may or may not be available. Full auto mode is basically doing all the work for you, so it doesn't give you the ability to change these features. But now that I'm in a more advanced mode, like aperture priority mode, I could now change these features. So priority set in white balance. This is a cool feature I wanted to show you guys. You can basically set the white balance priority to auto ambient or just white. So it'll prioritize the whites or it'll prioritize the ambient color in the room and that's a cool feature right now I have it set to standard and I just wanted to make you aware of that then you have dynamic range optimizer creative styles creative styles is basically how the camera is going to process the photos for you and there's a bunch of different options in there such as vivid neutral black and white and so forth then you have picture effects. This feature is only available when shooting in JPEG mode, but there's a lot of different picture effects in there you can play with. Picture profile is basically your video profiles, and there's PP1 through PP9, and this is where you get your S-Log2, S-Log3, gamma profiles, as you can see here. So that's more for advanced video shooting if you want to grade your video and post-processing. Now you have shutter auto white balance lock. You can have this set to continuous shooting or when you have the shutter pressed halfway down. This is fantastic for when you're basically at a sporting event and the lights are like slightly changing here and there. Your white balance will not shift when you're continuously shooting. So if you take a burst of like 20 shots, for example, the white balance is not gonna fluctuate when you're consecutively shooting, which can drastically speed up your post-processing time and it'll keep your colors more stable throughout the range you know so i have it set to continuous shooting mode it's a really great feature a couple other features here focus magnify time so focus magnify let me just show you that really quick so right now if i go into the function menu by hitting the fn button on the back of the camera i can change my focus mode you can also change your drive mode and focus area and so forth in this function menu but i want to show you some a manual focus trick all right, so now that I'm in manual focus, check out how you can just double tap to zoom in. And you can see there how it just zoomed in. You can scroll around the screen and then you can fine tune your focus to get it exactly where you want, like so. And then you just double tap again and it zooms out. So that's just a cool feature you can use when using manual focus if you're taking pictures of flowers or any situation where you're using manual focus. I particularly like that feature. Now I'm just going to go back into the function menu and I'm going to select focus mode and change it back to AFA, which basically automatically picks whether you're whether you need autofocus continuous or autofocus single shooting. It's a great place to have it. If you want to do sports photography, you're going to want to be in continuous shooting mode, which is AFC. So let me just switch back to AFA though, because that works quite well. Let me go back into the function menu and I just wanted to show you this setting over here. This is the metering mode and right now I have it set to highlight metering mode. So it's metering for the highlights and I use this particular mode when I was taking pictures of the moon because the moon is extremely bright and I wanted to make sure I got the exposure right and this made it a lot easier. It took all the guesswork out. I just had it set to highlight metering mode and it did all the work for me. Now if I change the metering mode back to multi, you can see the screen has gotten much brighter because it's metering for the whole scene now and not just the highlights. But granted, there is a lot of highlight information in this scene, so it didn't change drastically. But I just wanted to show you that, and that's under the metering mode option. And then of course, if you scroll down here, you have the white balance option here. It's currently set to auto white balance. You have exposure compensation up there. You have your ISO setting here. And if you go into your ISO settings, you can change that right here. You have auto. If you go to the right, there's a little arrow there. You can go to the right and you can change your minimum and your maximum ISO for auto ISO. So you can lower this to like 100. You can raise this all the way up to 102,400 if you want, or you can limit it, for example, to 25,600, which is where I like to have it, somewhere around there. So anyway, let's go back into the menu here. 
Now, we also have some more advanced features like focus peaking, which is a very nice feature if you're using manual lenses, and it'll basically show you where the high contrast areas are, which will help you focus when in manual focus mode. Then you have face registration. You can register faces on this camera, and then the camera will prioritize faces. Like there's a bunch of kids, for example, but you want your kid's face to be in focus. You can register faces and then prioritize your kid, and that's a really great feature. Self-portrait timer. That's basically when you have the camera set set to the screen set to 180 mode so it's facing you for a selfie and you go to take a picture it'll automatically put the camera in like a timer countdown mode and that's what that feature is right now I ha the camera has it set to on by default and if you keep going over to the right we're now in movie one and it's page one of nine now I just wanted to show you a couple things file format here this is where you would select 4k if you want 4k quality and of course this is the HD resolution quality and then once you have your file format set you can go down to record settings and that's where you can select your frame rates and bit rates. So when HD recording is set, you can have 120p, 24p, 30p, and 60p, for example. And the higher the number, the higher the bit rate, the larger the file size, but the better quality you're going to have. Then below that, we have your slow and quick settings. And in here, you can change your frame rate to all these different options. So this is great if you want to get slow motion video directly on the camera. You can use this mode if you want, or you want fast video, for example. You can use this feature for those types of things. I'm going to have to create a tutorial on this function, which I have not done yet, but I plan on doing at some point in the near future. Now you have AF drive speed and tracking sensitivities. You can change this. And again, if you're not sure what these settings mean, just hit that little garbage can button and it will switch to a description of what these modes mean. So this says switches the AF drive speed of the lens during autofocus. So it's basically how fast the lens will change autofocus from one point to another when it's transitioning. That's what the drive speed does. Tracking sensitivity, you can make that more responsive or standard. So it's whether it'll switch from one subject to another and what the sensitivity of the switching from one subject to another is. And audio recording, you can turn that on or off if you're using an external audio recorder, for example. Now, if we keep going to the right, audio level display, that's basically when you're in movie mode. You, it'll show you when you're in movie mode. It'll actually show you the audio on the screen there. See that? That's what the audio display is. So these are just video options here. Movie with shutter, you can have the movie record start with shutter. As it is by default, there's the record button over here on the grip. You can actually change that to the shutter button if you want. Silent shooting, you can turn the camera into silent shooting mode. It's grayed out right now because I'm in movie mode. Remember how I said, depending on what mode you're in, some features will be grayed out. That's why silent shooting is grayed out right now. And then you have release without lens. This is great if you're using fully manual lenses that have no electronics. The camera will just take the picture anyway. Same thing with the memory card. It's on by default, so it'll take a picture even if there's no memory card in there. Steady shot, you can turn that on or off in here. And if you go to steady shot settings, right now it's set to auto. But if you go in here, you can set it to manual. And this is great, again, if you're using fully manual lenses is you can tell the camera what kind of lens is on there. So for example, if I'm using a 35 millimeter seven artisans lens or something like that, for example, and I want the stabilization to work correctly, you would go in here and you would manually set it to 35 millimeter and because the, it, the camera is not going to know what kind of lens is on there. That's what this feature is for, and that's why you have the option to change it to manual. Really powerful, and that's a cool feature. If we go over here, we have zoom settings. Right now, you can have it set to optical zoom only, but you can change that. You can turn clear image zoom on, and you will get additional zoom beyond what the lens is capable of, and uh, that's a powerful feature. And if you're, this also works for photography if you shoot in JPEG mode, but not in RAW mode. You also have options for zebra settings. Again, these are advanced video features to help you figure out what your exposure levels are with your white levels and things like that. Grid lines, this will actually bring up lines on the screen, You can, which will help you frame your compositions and stuff. Rule of thirds is a good one. Let me just show you what that looks like. So now you can see I have the rule of thirds grid on my screen. Again, I'm not going to go over every single feature in here. I just wanted to show you a couple of key features. Otherwise, this review will be forever. So you got custom keys here. If you go in here, this is where you can custom program your different buttons and notice how it shows you a picture of the buttons 
and you have one of four pages. So if you go over to the right, you have more custom buttons. Now you have the custom buttons on the top and then you have custom buttons. Some lenses have a custom button on them and you could then adjust that here and, and put it as to what you want. And you can also have custom keys for photos, custom keys for video and custom keys for playback. So you can set your custom keys for each function that you're currently in. And then the function menu set, this is where you can control the items that you have in your function menu. So again, very powerful and highly customizable camera. Dial wheel setup. So by default, this top dial here is going to be aperture and this navigation dial is going to be shutter speed if you're in manual mode so you can change that around if you prefer function of touch operation now right now I have it set to touch tracking and that's a really great feature if you're tracking moving subjects but you can also have it set to touch to focus or you can have it set to touch to shutter so let me just change it to aperture priority mode so if I touch to focus it's now gonna focus where I touch so if I touch here and then focus by pressing the shutter halfway down, it's gonna focus where I have touched. Now in order to cancel that, like if you wanna cancel that, you have to press this little hand with the X on the top there, or you can press the center button here on the navigation dial, and that will cancel the spot that you had currently activated for touch to focus. Audio signals, now you can turn the audio signals off. You hear this focus, how it's making that beep noise, which is incredibly annoying. You wanna go in here and you wanna turn that off pretty much immediately. And you can see it'll still give you the green dots showing you that the focus is locking, but it won't give you that annoying beep, which drives a lot of people crazy, especially if you're in a situation like a church or at a wedding or something like that. Now, if we go over to the right, we have network options here. This is where you would control the send to smartphone function, which is basically set to the function button by default. Also, there's send to computer, view on TV. You can control the camera with your smartphone. You would go in here to enable that and you can turn that feature on, it's off by default. And then to connect the app on the phone with the camera, you would just go to connection here and it's gonna turn the standby on and then it'll give you a QR code and you could then connect the app to the camera and then you have, have remote control ability on the camera. Now, if we keep going over to the right, you have more options, Bluetooth setting, location info and so forth. You got playback settings. You can also go in here and you can set your continuous playback for interval shooting. So if you take a time-lapse interval series of photos, you can actually play that back in here and it'll give you a sample of what the time lapse looks like so you can actually watch the time lapse on your camera and that's where you can use that feature it's an awesome feature and i go over that in my time lapse tutorial video as well but that's where that is it's in playback mode and then you have more options in here in playback slideshow and so forth so if you have it hooked up to a tv you can go into slideshow and, and do a nice slideshow on your television to show your friends and stuff now further you go into the setup mode it looks like a little briefcase and here are some more advanced settings such as monitor brightness i like to have it set to sunny weather so you can actually see the monitor nice and bright depending on what condition you're in by default it is set up to manual like that and you can see now it's a lot dimmer for this environment, that's actually not a bad setup, but I'm gonna go back in there and change it to sunny weather so it's a little bit brighter. Volume settings, this is for playback so you can hear how loud it is. And then delete confirmation if you're in playback mode and you wanna delete photos. Display quality, it's set to standard by default, but you can change that to high. It will look a little bit better, but it will also cost you a little bit more battery life. Power save startup time, this is set to one minute by default and that'll basically automatically turn the camera off if you're not using it. One minute is really fast. It'll help you out with saving some battery life, but personally, I like to have it set for at least two minutes because it drives me crazy when the camera turns off when I'm in the middle of doing something. Auto power off temperature. This is where you would wanna to go to set that to high. So when the camera starts to get hot, it doesn't automatically shut off. If you set it to high, it'll take a lot longer before the camera shuts off. This is important if you're doing extended 4K recording, for example. Now, depending on what frame rate you want to use, you would go in here to change that. It's in your NTSC PAL selector. 24 frames per second, for example, and 120 frames per second is going to be NTSC, and that's for North America. If you're over in Europe and things like that, you use the PAL standard, and that's 25 frames per second, for example, 100 frames per second, 50 frames per second. And if you need to change your frame rate, that's where you would do it. It's in that area there. And then touch operation, you could turn that off if you don't want to use the touch screen. Some people don't like the touch screen. 
you can actually turn that feature off right there. It's on by default. And then you have touch panel options. You can change the way the touch panel works. Basically, the screen is considered a touch panel when you're using the electronic viewfinder, which is here, and you can change settings like that in there if you want to do that. Also, you can turn the IR remote control setting on and off, so you can control the camera with the remote from the front. You can turn that feature on and off here. It is off by default. Then you have time code and user bit settings. All those settings are in here, and that's for like advanced movie recording if you're trying to sync up multiple cameras and things like that. USB power, so you can usually power the camera via the USB port and things like that. You can change your language and so forth. And date and time setup. Here's where you can set your area setting, copyright information. You can format the memory card and change your file names and stuff. Different folder options. If you go in here to version, that'll show you the current version of the camera. So this is your firmware version. So this is important to check and you want to keep that up to date. When it comes out with new firmware, you want to update that. Then you have a settings reset if you want to put it back to factory default. And then again, you have my menu area. And if you go to page two of the my menu area, this is where you can add an item. So if I go in here and add an item, I can just go to the right. You can see there's 32 pages of options in here. So let's say I want file format. I can add that. I'll add it right there. And then if I go back by hitting the menu button and go back to page one, now I have format and now I have file format there. So you can see how it added that feature that I just added. So I want to change it to JPEG. Now I can easily just do that without having to find it in the menu system. So my menu is really powerful and you could add multiple pages of stuff. It'll just keep adding pages as you add more items. That is basically a crash course into the menu system. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you in the function menu is the drive modes. And drive mode is right here, and that right now it's set to single shooting. So if you want to change your drive mode to continuous shooting, this is what you're going to want to use for sports photography, and you can actually change this speed here. Right now it's set to low. You can change it to high plus, which is 11 frames per second. But you also have high, medium, and low. And that's a really great feature if you don't want to take you know, that many photos just consecutively. So I recommend setting it to high or medium for the most part, but if you want the 11 frames per second, go to high plus. Then you have self timer here. This is an awesome feature if you wanna have the camera set to a self timer. So it'll basically count two seconds and then take the shot. And this is really good for getting those rock steady shots when using a tripod. That little bit of camera shake you get when you press the shutter button, that two second timer will help eliminate that. And you can also set it to a longer period of time like 10 seconds if you wanna do a selfie and you wanna get in front of the camera for example. You could just start the process, run in front of the camera and so forth. Then you have bracketing and continuous bracketing. This is a great feature for HDR photography. And I have that set normally to two EVs and three images. And that's a good place to start if you wanna do HDR photography. The camera will then continuously take three shots at two EV intervals. So you'll get a negative two, a zero, and a plus two. And there's more bracketing features in here if you scroll down. And that is basically the drive mode. And I'm just hitting the function menu to get to this stuff, guys. Now focus area. If you go into focus area, you have all these different focus areas. But since touch to focus came out, I pretty much just touch where I want the camera to focus. I don't really use focus area that much anymore. But the focus area will help you narrow down where the camera focuses, which is quite powerful for certain applications. For example, if I have it set to center, you can see now there's a rectangle there in the center and the camera will only focus on the center area. Let me just move it like so. I just moved it up a little bit so it focuses on the box, but it's only going to focus in that one area. So it's very similar to touch to focus, except it just puts it in the center. But you could always override that by touching the screen like so, and then cancel it by hitting the center here on the navigation wheel. So let me go back into the function menu. And then you have flexible spot, so you could basically move it around. But again, touch to focus kind of it makes it just better. All right, so the last focus area I wanted to show you was the expand flexible spot. And this is a great feature to have set if you're, especially if you're using touch to focus, because the camera will basically have this small little square, but it'll expand out from that square. And it's great for tracking moving subjects in particular. You can see how it has those little AF points that expand outward. So it's a tiny little focus point but it expands out. See how it's expanding out to get that ball in the background? 
It's a great feature and it works with touch to focus. So I'm just going to switch it back to wide mode because I tend to use this mode most due to the fact that you can just touch anywhere at any given time and then cancel it by pressing the center button here. So that's basically the function menu. And let me just show you playback really quick. If you hit the playback button, you can scroll through your different photos and view them. And if you hit the display button here on the top of the navigation wheel, you can change the way that it displays. So you can get all the information like this or limited information. And then you can just turn the navigation wheel to scroll through your photos. And here's a moon photo I took the other night that came out really good. There's a button here on the top you can hit and it'll zoom in as you can see. So now I'm zoomed in to the photo and you can get a better look. And then you can just turn the navigation wheel to zoom in and out or move up and down like so. And just look at that crater, it's unbelievable. So that's how you would do that. And then if you hit the playback button, it'll zoom back out like so. And then there's videos. You can actually play videos if you want. And it'll show you. And you can once you start the video, you could then scroll to using the navigation wheel to speed up. That is pretty much it for the overview of the menu system and how to use the basic controls of the camera. All right, guys. So at the end of the day, the Sony a6600 is a very powerful crop factor e-mount camera from Sony and I recommend it. It's a it's a great camera. It's a lot of money though. $1,400 is a lot of money. The downgrade in buffer size is really my biggest problem with the a6600. I don't understand why Sony decided to do that. Other than that, it's a fantastic camera. It performed amazing. The autofocus is awesome. The sensor stabilization also works great. It works great in video and for photos. And uh, I was very impressed with that. The 180 degree flip screen, the touch to focus and all those features are really, really great. And it makes it a very good option for doing filming like I'm doing right now. So you can see the screen when you're recording for selfie vlogging type stuff. It's a very good feeling body. Like it feels very rigid. Even with that huge 200 to 600 millimeter lens, I was able to just let it hang and the camera felt like a little brick it's very very sturdy camera and it's very well made and it's got like a little bit beefier weather ceiling than the previous model as well without that flash on the top so you can be a little bit more confident in inclement weather with the a6600 now again though for fourteen hundred dollars it leaves the door open to possibly just go full frame i mean the a7 III you can pick up for around two thousand dollars and you know now you have a full frame camera with sensor stabilization so with awesome autofocus as well but the a7 III does not have a flip screen it doesn't have quite the super advanced autofocus system like the a6600 does but it is a full frame camera so it will offer better image quality at the end of the day due to the larger sensor so it's worth considering in addition as i already mentioned the a6500 is currently on sale at the time of this review and you can pick one up for 800 dollars brand new that's an unbelievably good deal for a fantastic camera i mean the a6500 is no slouch when it comes to sports photography the autofocus system on that camera is phenomenal as well you know it's not as good as the a6 600 or the a6400 or the a6100 but it's still very good and very competent when it comes to sports the a6600 really did perform great it's a very high quality camera in my opinion and i do recommend it for those in the market that have the money and they want the latest and greatest it's a really good option to consider and i really enjoyed using it i had a lot of fun using it you know i wish i had one myself of course but right now i'm using the a6400 for the most part because i'm usually on a tripod when i'm doing the work i'm doing but it is really nice to have that sensor stabilization when you're hand holding in lower light situations. If you are in the need for something like that, the A6600 or the A6500 is definitely worth considering in my opinion. So I really hope you got what you were looking for in this review. Please remember below the video in the description area, I'm going to have links to recommended accessories and so forth, and also links to all the different tutorials that I created for the A6600 and my e-mount lens guides. If you're looking for a lens for your camera my guides will really help you out highly recommend checking those out and if you guys have any questions please let me know in the comments area below do you have the a6600 what do you think about it do you, are you considering getting one but you're just like nah no way it's not worth it well let me know in the comments area because people read that and the information is very valuable to those in the market so don't hesitate to leave a comment below the video i appreciate it i really enjoy reading them and a lot of other people will also appreciate your input that is about it for this review and I really hope you guys have a great day. I will catch up with you guys next time. Have a good one. Take care.